afternoon. Big data, machine learning, cloud, analytics. These are all things that you hear, listen to, see every day today. We have an exciting, thought-provoking, knowledgeful session planned for you today. In this session today, we will talk about why big data and analytics is such an opportunity for Singapore, its society, its businesses, and the individuals assembled here today. The minister yesterday spoke about how Singapore wants to become a smart nation. And he specifically talked about how big data and analytics is one of the foundational building blocks of how that will enable Singapore to become such. Today, we want to cover for you what are the fundamental building blocks, the foundations that are necessary for achieving this objective. We want to talk about the people, the process, and what is it that you have to do to be able to achieve this. We want to cover what are the challenges that you're going to see in this journey and as you look to this uh, new area in the marketplace. The way we're going to do this, we're going to, uh, each of our speakers will make an opening statement. Then we'll have a number of questions that they will answer based on some of these themes that I mentioned. So let us now take you on this very interesting topic and journey. So for our panelists, what is so exciting about data and this whole area of big data and analytics? Why should the audience present here today care about big data and analytics? Masan, we'll start with you. So um, there's a few reasons. Um, in, in my view, big data and machine learning, which sort of goes hand in hand with big data, present uh, a tremendous opportunity for business and society, but they also pose some significant risks. Um, and it's wise to consider those in a balanced kind of way. Fundamentally, what's happened over the last few years is that we've gone from a paradigm of specification, where we specify systems, to a paradigm of learning, where we actually get the machine to learn interesting stuff, the right stuff, from data. When you adopt machine learning, you sort of, the, the mindset is really one of sort of autonomous learning. It's not like you build a model and you call it a day. There's data that continues to come in, and so you really need a process that you trust, a process where you uh, are going to learn the right kinds of things, a process where you can actually uh, trust the predictions of your system, um, and also tolerate the errors that it'll make, right? Because all of these systems make errors. So uh, ultimately, it's a balance between the benefits you get from this sort of autonomous learning process and the, the risks associated with making uh, wrong decisions. Okay. Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a joy to be here. Um, actually, I feel a bit of an imposter on the panel because uh, I'm not really a data guy. Um, it was only in April of this year that I actually became the chief data officer as well as being the chief transformation officer at DBS. But, and, but since then, I've been on this learning journey about all things big data and analytics. And, and through that journey, I've asked a lot of people, you know, what is it? What is this thing, big data? What does it mean to be a data-driven company? And of course, every time I ask that question, I get different answers. But really, what after nine months or so into the, into the job, I kind of distilled this, this thing down into... You know, this well, data-driven company is simply a company that maximizes value from data. And what occurs to me, actually, is there's a lot of talk about big data, but certainly data-rich companies like banks have had da data, a lot of data for the longest time. And it seems that, you know, most banks are only using a small fraction of the data that they already have. So there's all this talk about getting external sources of data, etc. But if, you know, there's a, just an enormous amount of excitement about getting the additional value from existing data. Um, um, and for me, um, the trick of this whole thing is learning how to unlock that value. And we kind of distilled that value into two broad buckets. Uh, and one is the one that everybody talks about at these kind of conferences a lot. It's the AIs, it's the, the models, it's, pre it's predictive analytics, et cetera. And, and there's a lot of, lot of in, uh, value there. Um, but I think there's another element of, of uh, value from data which is less talked about, uh, typically, but in my view, could even have more, more value to it, which is this idea about uh, making our decision-making more data-driven. 
you know, we've all grown up in this, this situation where uh, we've allowed to uh, encourage to use our judgment. Um, you know, but we, when data is more available, what we, if we learn to uh, learn to see what the data is telling us and make decisions based off data, either existing data that we have or where we don't have the data by running experiments, I think you know you can start to compete on just making better decisions. Kevin. So I think one of the most exciting things about data analytics, AI, ML, is really the opportunity to unlock uh, access to financial services by way of uh, allowing new customer segments to be served or optimize the existing customer segments and the way that you treat them. And, and we at, at Demis do focus on facilitating a, a data access ecosystem as everyday, interesting, indicative, orthogonal, predictive data continues to come online, whether it be from footfall patterns or uh, satellite imagery or social media data or unstructured data. Um, I think what, what's kind of exciting is the opportunity to, to at scale, mobilize that information into a, a financial institution's uh, environment so that they could actually make use of it in a, in a compliant, permissible, secure, and effective manner. And really what that's, what that's kind of facilitating is interesting innovations across the financial ecosystem, whether it be you know, new mobile app and payment systems to, to uh, thin file, no file, credit opportunities in emerging markets to really just better treatment of your existing customers through retention or service or longevity. And to me, that's probably one of the more exciting things. The, the data is probably the, the foundational layer of it, whether it's internal or external. Uh, it seems to be the building blocks of, of a lot of the analytic opportunities that people are putting into market. So. Simon. Hi, everybody. Um, so I just flew into Singapore a few hours ago. So for me, it's 6 a.m. So if I say anything that's very strange or a little unusual, I apologize. I'm a bit jet lagged. For me, Big data really is about the ability to answer questions. Um, I'm a consumer of data. Um, I was an auditor for many years. I was in operational risk management for many years. So for me, the key, the most important thing is that data, whether it's big, little, small, it can actually help you answer questions. And the key is the question. If you don't even begin to think about the question, how can you possibly get to anything like the right answer? So I guess for me, one of the key things about big data is it gives you the ability to frame the question differently, maybe ask a different question, actually go deeper. You might in the past have only been able to sample some of the data, not all of it. So for me, big data is an opportunity that just allows you to think bigger. And that's a, I think that's a really important thing. Can you provide some real examples of how big data and analytics is used in uh, your organizations and the things that you're involved in. Vasant. Yeah, so um, I think the applications are quite diverse. Um, uh, you know, I, I can see it being used in, in investing, um, you know, as I'm doing. Um, it's used in debt and credit, um, used in uh, risk management, uh, reg tech, uh, processes, analytics, right? So those are some of the broad areas in which we're seeing applications. And if you look at a typical VC portfolio, that's kind of, and look at a pie chart, it's going to, and payments, of course, right? it'll just break down into those seven or eight general categories. So that's, that's what I'm seeing, is applications across uh, all of these different areas. And specifically, if you get into things like credit, um, there's all kinds of sort of interesting sub-problems having to do with underwriting, um, you know, making collection more efficient, um, you know, early warning systems that actually tell you when, when, when loans are going bad, so those are the kinds of applications we're seeing where, you know, as Paul said, uh, you can actually make better decisions with data. Uh, the question obviously becomes, are you supporting decision making or are you handing control of decision making to the machine? Uh, and I'm of the view that, uh, you know, to the extent possible, you actually want to hand over control of decision making to the machine, if it's possible, but of course it depends on you know, how often you make mistakes and the consequences of those mistakes, right? So if, if you don't make too many mistakes and the consequences are not severe, then you will tend to hand control over to the machine. Paul, you've been very actively involved over the last several years in big data and analytics. Can you talk about some of the real world examples from your space? 
Yeah, sure. So about four or five years ago, we uh, formed a partnership with ASTAR here in uh, Singapore. And for those of you out of town, ASTAR is a kind of arm of the Singapore government that does research and has an arm around data analytics. And these guys taught us how to use data in ways that we had not done before. So banks have used data to make decisions for the longest time, but it's primarily around risk or marketing. And some of the early projects we did with these guys were, uh, for example, our audit department um, started to tr use predictive analytics to determine which of our branches would have the next operational error so that they could sequence their audits more effectively. Um, our HR department started to analyze unusual employee behavior so they could predict, for example, when one of our relationship managers was about to resign so we could intervene. Um, DBS has the busiest ATM network on the planet, so we have to take uh, the uptime of that very seriously. So we, we use data to uh, predict the length of queues. We also use data to predict when an ATM is going to have a mechanical failure. You know, so what these all things had in common were they were very real business problems, but more importantly, on those early stages in particular, um, they had clear sponsorship in the, uh, from senior people in the company. And that's kind of where we found the early use, stages, uh, use cases. Okay. This session, of course, is about the, the building blocks, laying the bricks for big data and analytics. So if I could just give a quick overview of some of the, um, the building blocks that uh, you should be um, looking into for big data and analytics. First of all, over the last um, several years, there's been a lot of hype in this space about what big data is and what big data is not. So let's mention that a little bit here. So first of all, big data is about leveraging all of your data. It's about your structured data, unstructured data, your voice transcripts, um, it's your um, log files, being able to bring all that together, linking it together and being able to analyze it. Second, big data doesn't always have to be about big data, petabytes. It can be about small data because it is also a new technology paradigm whereby you have emerging new technologies such as Hadoop and Spark. It is about machine learning. It is about natural language processing. It's about new sets of tools that enable you to essentially bring data together and enable you to visualize it. And uh, so it's a new paradigm, has new technologies, new players in it, and it can run both in-house, in, in your own data centers, it can run on the cloud. So that is the building blocks that companies are using today to essentially get into this big data ecosystem and be able to leverage all of the data and do all the analytics. Um, now, related to this, gentlemen, one of the biggest um, themes and topics that everyone talks about is data lakes, right? So if I could get you, Kevin, to start. What is the data lake and in, in, in the things that you're involved in, how are you bringing various types of data together to enable people to create data lakes? Sure. I, I personally still am trying to figure out what big data is. I, I think we at Demis used to say we work in medium data and people would ask me what that means and I'd say, I don't know, what's big data? And the concept of a data lake versus uh, different storage capabilities for data is, is, is not something that we actually r really focus on. It's, it's, a, it's a slightly fundamental difference, the, the way that we approach um, enabling the use of emerging in large quantities of data uh, versus kind of putting, putting everything into a pot to stir it up, synthesize it, store it, and allow it to be used, um, but instead approach a, a methodology of accessing data via programmatic calls to external data sources that extend outside of an organization's firewall so that uh, interesting indicative information points about a person, a place, or an asset can be brought into an ecosystem either for, for training, an analytic, uh, uh, training an analytic model or actually productionizing the data use. I, I think there's, there's absolutely value in, in, in data lakes for streaming data stores or operational data silos, but the, the concept of trying to, to capture all of this data that continues to come online primarily outside of an organization and bring it into your firewall and put it into a massive, uh, massive store is, is going to be hard to keep up with as, 
as that data just continues to come online at an increasing pace, whether it's, you know, Moore's law has shifted from hardware into the actual data environment or just us and our, our digital twins continuing to create a footprint that, that expands across, across the silos. So maybe not the data lake concept, but the, the mentality of what happens when, when all of the world is queryable as a data set itself, more as a, a utility. Is, is something that we like to think about. Paul, you, your organization has built a data lake, and one of the, the key focuses has been about driving business value. So how do you drive business value from a data lake from big data and analytics? Yeah, so we have got a data store. We actually shy away from the term data lake, and there are two reasons for doing that. One is uh, that the lake or the storage component is not enough in its own right. You need to have the whole package, the whole platform, you know, the way you get the data in, how you get it out, how you uh, do the analytics on that. So it's, you'd rather think about it in a more holistic term. But more importantly, and you, which you touched on, is that you know a lot of these programs fail. A lot of these data programs fail. And the vast majority of the time they do that is because they start up thinking, let's build a lake. Wouldn't we need a lake? Let's get all that data in there. As opposed to starting with the specific set of business problems you're trying to solve and solving them one by one. And then at some point in time, it makes it usually worth your while to start putting your data in one place. And, and that's what we're trying very hard to do at, at DBS. And we certainly haven't completed our work at all on the construction of the infrastructure, but we are building the infrastructure one use case at a time. Okay. Cloud is the, the new emerging factor into this whole big data ecosystem. So Vasant, can you talk a little bit about cloud and what the, um, um, for example, how can um, government and um, um, entities such as governmental entities leverage things such as cloud to be able to go into the big data ecosystem? So uh, just before I, I get into that, I just want to echo something that, that Paul said, and it has to do with sort of laying the bricks. And I think the, the, the trick is sort of laying the right bricks. Right? Um, very often, data doesn't really come packaged in a form that's usable already. Right? So if, you're, you know, if, you want to, if you want to improve collections, for example, and you have no data uh, on alternative treatments for collections, you're not going to be able to build a predictive model. Um, now, coming back to your uh, question about society, so um, just FYI, I'm the editor of a journal called Big Data. Next month's issue is on computational propaganda, which is all about fake news. It's the first uh, academic set of papers on, on the subject that we started planning about a year and a half ago. Um, and these are big problems for society uh, as to, uh, you know, how do you really want to use these vast amounts of data that are being collected, uh, you know, that are available either through social media or other kinds of telecommunication systems. Um, some of the really interesting uses I'm seeing uh, have to do with, uh, for example, can you assess the impact of a policy change? So when India uh, demonetized, there was actually a change in luminosity. Uh, you know, that was visible shortly after demonetization, which told you that it had dampened economic activity. Um, and that's just a simple example of the kinds of uh, ways in which you can actually use sensor data and correlate it to policy decisions uh, or either regulatory decisions. Um, regulators, for example, face a big problem in terms of looking at the threat of instability or threats to stability of a system. Uh, again, that's a huge challenge because these things have not occurred yet. You know, you don't have sufficient amounts of label data, and yet you're trying to guard against future kinds of threats, like really difficult uh, problems to deal with, but really important problems. When you talk about big data today, it is about both data and analytics. And one of the emerging opportunities in this whole area is about visualizing data where you have large volumes of data, what are the patterns, and being able to see them visually so that a business person can appreciate it. Simon, can you talk about the whole opportunity around visualization of data, big data, and visual yeah. analytics? <laughs> yeah, I think this is uh, quite an important area. I think one of the things for me is that humans, 80 to 90% of humans think visually. So the ability to see the outcome of your analytics is vital, it's really important. We often think about analytics as being a new thing. 
if we kind of go back when I was young, we talked about reporting, then it became management information or MI, then business intelligence, BI, now we use the word analytics. It's kind of the same thing, but maybe just with some added stuff, you know? Visualizing data though is, gives you the ability to actually see things. And I think one of the, the big things for me is the ability to see results and then fail fast. You need to be able to see where do you have problems with your data to start with. The ability to very quickly say, where do we do something? Who does that? Um, where do we do it? Can we see it geographically? Can we plot it on a map? Personally, I'm, I'm a big fan of charts. You know, my two favorites, bar charts and scatter plots. You know, scatter plots are amazing. You can see outliers. And bar charts, there's no better way to compare something. Sorry, I'm not a fan of pie charts for anyone in the room, okay? Um, but, uh, you know, the ability to visualize, see things quickly, see the results, be able to then dive in and drill into the information, and then go on to the next question. For me, as I said earlier, for me, it's all about the, the questioning of the data. And to be able to use that visualization to, to do what we call self-service analytics, where you can put the, the data out to the edges of your company to allow individuals to actually ask their own questions. We all love Excel, I love Excel, but even Excel has its limits. And when you're in the realms of big data, a million records in a worksheet and you're done. You know? But if you're in the realms of you know, five, 10 uh, million records or many, many more, billions of records even, you, you need something else. You need a, a platform that allows you to really drill into that and then ideally see it. But Sam, in some of the work you're doing, you're leveraging visualization as a key part of some of the machine learning work you're doing. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's a question we get from investors all the time, is uh, things like, can you tell us conditions under which the model will work well or not work well? Um, and the ability to explain uh, a model, particularly a machine learning-based model, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, and so that's an area in which I think there's a lot of scope for research and, and more inquiry is in just making these systems more transparent. Because one of the, you know, one of the benefits of machine learning is that it gives you, um, it surfaces patterns before reasons for them become apparent, right? So it can, it can show you stuff like that and you may not have thought about asking the question. So I mean, the way I look at machine learning is instead of you saying, um, show me the data that satisfy this pattern, you're basically saying, show me the pattern that satisfy the data, right? So it sort of turns that process around on its head, um, but at the same time, it makes, it can make uh, the model somewhat more opaque, right? It's not a simple model that someone has specified, it's something that's been learned by a system, and so the, uh, the need to make this more visual, for lack of a better term, becomes absolutely critical. Paul, if you were an organization looking to get started with big data and analytics, where would you start? And uh, um, what, what are the, I guess, some of the, the challenges that you're going to face as you get going? Okay, um, getting started. So I, I think the, the, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. I think the way to get started is get going. You know, do not wait around and get the perfect infrastructure. Um, I would definitely start with. Uh, getting a number of people together in a room. I'd get a business sponsor who was progressive, had a real need and a real business problem to work on. I would then put in with him, I'd put uh, some project team members who understand the business problem, and then a series of data scientists, and just let them figure it out themselves. And this is exactly, after a number of iterations, is what we ended up doing at DBS and finally got a, a, a pattern that worked, and that's exactly what happened. And all the initial successes came when these three guys got together. If, if you start and wait for perfect data, if you start and wait for the perfect infrastructure, then you'll, you'll never really get going. And it's quite amusing when you start s starting to see a data scientist guy try and even talk to a business guy. That just takes a while to sort out, just the language. And then once they decide well, how data can help, is it will take you a long time to get the data, you know, because banks, and DBS is no exception, uh, for the longest time have had a philosophy of we need to lock down data. You know, we really need to make sure nobody gets their hands on that data. You know, so every policy, every procedure, every aspect of our security says don't use the data. So expect to spend some time just trying to get access to your own data. Yeah. 
Today, um, when I work with some of the global banks, Kevin, one of the biggest challenges I see is related to data privacy, data protection, and actually being able to even move the data from one country to another to be able to bring it together and analyze it. Can you talk about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that you're seeing in that area? Because you work with uh, that as one of the key focuses for what you do. Yeah, so data privacy, cross-border data, consent, permissibility. I mean, it, it, it is the, the hot button issue as machine learning makes, uh, to, to Vasant's comment, I mean, makes the patterns easily recognizable and the insights from, from interesting niche data sources. It's, it's not as much as let's put it into a model and see if it works, if it pops. It's, it's kind of that plus the added dimension of, well, is this compliant? You know, is this creepy data? Are we permissibly allowed to access, use, and store this data? And here in, here in APAC, it's, it's even more intricate given the fragmented regions and countries and different regulations of you know, Indonesian data can't leave or what can be processed in a Singapore AWS environment or what data about a consumer can be used versus data that can be used about an entity and ensuring compliance with those rules and regulations is, is something that large FIs take very seriously because the cost of getting it wrong is not worth the incremental cost of, of marginal customer acquisition or, or, or treatments. And I think what, what's really interesting here in Singapore is to see MAS and, and other regulatory bodies across the region kind of start to take steps forward by laying out the framework of one, you know, what can be done with the data either on-prem or in the cloud, two, what is fair and compliant with data use, how long can you use the data, and starting to, to lay those, those tracks that people can kind of follow on and, and understand that they're not operating on the wrong side of data privacy and data regulations. And I think that, that allows a lot of, of tailwinds to allow organizations to then take those steps forward and start to not just test and learn from data, but push them into production and start to capture the value. So regulatory guidance on, on data privacy and consent is a, is a great opportunity to differentiate. Okay. One of the other key building blocks of this whole paradigm is the people and the processes. So one of the opportunities for Singapore is becoming that smart nation through its people. So Vasan, if I'm somebody in the audience who wants to be a data scientist and wants to go into this ecosystem, what is it that I need to learn? What skills do I need to develop as somebody from Singapore? So, you know, one of the... Uh you know, so we, we've actually, uh, at, at the Stern School of Business, just uh, started a specialization in fintech. And, and this last semester, I, I co-taught a course called Foundations of Fintech. Um, and it has four sort of critical uh, basic components to it. And I, you know, I tell people that they should get clued up and skilled up in these areas. Um, you know, the first is privacy, security, the sort of building blocks, so to speak, of the internet. Um, the other is data science. Uh, you know, how do you really leverage data? Uh, the other is, you know, this emerging world of crypto, blockchain, uh, the, and, the, you know, these kinds of technologies that I think hold great promise sort of in the post-trade processing part of the financial life cycle. Uh, and then just strategy, just how, how do you really think strategically about the opportunities in fintech. Um, and to me, the strategy part really consists of, you know, you asked earlier, um, how should you, if you're a manager, how do you really think about, uh, you know, what you should do? Um, and typically, you know, the, the problem with a lot of organizations or a lot of initiatives is that they tend to be sort of either driven by a, a, a functional area uh, as opposed to involving the CEO or the CFO as part of the process. Uh, and I think we need to get to the point where senior management is really involved in setting up a data science strategy, right? So if you've got 20 or 30 potential projects you can do, how should you order them, right? Which ones should you think of doing first? Uh, and the way I tend to think about that is in terms of risk, right? Do, do the ones that offer the lowest risk, right? Where the predictability is highest, and I refer to sort of the, the cost of error are the lowest, right? That's where you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. Paul, 
today, DBS, you're one of the, the largest banks here, one of the largest employers. What are the types of opportunities that folks in this ecosystem can expect from, for example, a DBS? Um, yeah, so clearly being uh, data literate, if that's a word or phrase, uh, is highly advantageous uh, moving forward. But, you know, but I think a lot of people overestimate the need for truly deep data science, you know, the real PhDs in maths. There is a need for those kind of guys. But actually what I'm finding on my own personal learning journey is you don't need to be an absolute PhD um, to have a career in data. I am living proof, hopefully, that I have a, a future career in, in data. Yet I'm an engineer by background, so I, I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable with numbers and maths and data, but I haven't got a PhD in statistics. Um, what there is an enormous need for, uh, and we were talking about this uh, yesterday, uh, is people who can translate. People who, as I mentioned, I alluded to this a minute ago about the, the disconnect between the PhD math guy and the business guy. There's a gulf of, of communication gap there that people can fill. And if you've got a little bit of business acumen and a little bit of math uh, numeracy, then there's an opportunity for you to kind of build on that and make a, a huge career out of that. And when I look at the, the gaps that I, in my current team, that's where they are. And that's kind of where we're trying to build our strength. So, we have these bricks laid. Let's talk a little bit about the benefits. So, how can businesses benefit quickly from big data? So, Simon, let's start with you. So, big, I'm in a really privileged position. I get the, the chance to travel around the world. I speak to lots of people working for banks and insurance companies. And uh, they tell me how they use data, big data, how they analyze it, and the things that they do. And I hear some incredible stories. So there's just there's two quick stories I'd kind of like to share. Um, I was speaking to a bank in Spain um, a couple of months ago. They have uh, an, three data environments. Okay, so the first one is a very traditional data warehouse, and it's where they produce what they call guided analysis dashboards, if you like. And they have a team of specialists that develop the dashboards, and they, these dashboards are used by thousands of users across the bank. I think we all recognize that. That's very traditional dashboarding kind of business intelligence. The other extreme that they've implemented a few months ago is what they call a sand pit data environment. So that's hooking into um, a Hadoop-based data lake, combine that with their kind of data warehouse from Oracle. And what they're doing is they've given a tool uh, to allow their users just to go and explore the data and actually just drill into that data as much as they can. Um, they came up with 600 use cases in six months. It was, it was staggering. When they, just get, they gave it to 1,500 people and said, don't use Excel, use this instead, and go and find out what you can find out. One of the key things that, that struck me was that the fraud team began to identify some problems with their cash point machines. Maybe you have this problem in Singapore. There are these devices that you can put on ATM machines that will skim read your card as you put your card into the machine. They, these fraudsters will put a camera nearby the, the machine as well, so they try and get the card details as well as your PIN number at the same time. So what the fraud team found was that when these machines are on the, the ATM, the speed of the card slows down just enough for them to detect it in the data. Now we're talking big data because there are millions of ATM transactions every single day across this bank's network. So they're monitoring millions of transactions to see minute differences in the speed of the card entering into their machine. And then what they're doing is they've got a dashboard that instantly creates an alert when this happens. They contact the branch and say, quickly, there's a device on your machine, go and get that. Okay, so that's trying to pre pre find and then prevent fraud quite quickly. The second one is uh, around uh, telematics, the use of boxes in cars. So we're, we're seeing a number of customers now are taking boxes, the data from these boxes. They're pushing that into applications that then allow them to analyze where people are driving, when they're driving, and how they're driving. Uh, for those people in the audience from the UK, there's a big insurance company called Aviva. They have a, a mobile phone app called Aviva Drive, and it monitors where you drive, when you drive, how you drive. And all of that is analyzed and then put into a dashboard that's used by their own users 
to actually help them cross-sell, upsell, and understand the kind of claims behavior of their drivers as well. So for me, there's just a couple of simple examples of a bank and insurance company using big data to do some really interesting, clever things. Let's take a couple of uh, questions from the audience, please. What are your views on regulators' response on big data and analytics? Paul, Vasant? Thank you. Thank you, Vasant. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question? What are your views on regulators' response on big data and analytics? Okay. Well, I think, first of all, um, you know, we're very lucky here in, in Singapore to have a, such a progressive regulator um, who embraces dialogue and deep discussion about some of the very thorny issues that data uh, 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 casts up. If you think about some of the other innovations that are out there, you know, they're not quite so deeply ethical in nature. You know, some of the ethical challenges that data presents are quite profound, you know, and it's going to cause regulators an awful lot of challenge, as well as companies, about how to navigate that. So, um, I, th I, would, you know, I, I hope that regulators will engage with industry and, and talk through that. But more importantly, or equally as importantly, I should say, is that the nature of data is becoming more and more global. And you know, this idea that trying to establish ownership of data and having data reside in specific uh, locations is becoming also very challenging. So what, it'd be fantastic if regulators could start speaking to each other and having a, a cross-regulator conversation to tackle some of these other issues that are coming up. Another key question from the audience. Sorry, Joji, can I just comment sure. on that? Sorry. of course. Um, I used to work for the UK regulator, the FSA, um, and one of the key things there that they, were, they care about, they don't really care about the nature of the data. They don't care about the size. They care about the treatment of data. So for them, it's, it's how you secure it, govern it. It needs to be transparent. If you're running data through models that then result in capital numbers, for example, Solvency 2, Basel 2, Mifid 2, those kinds of things. They care about how the data moves on its journey, that you can see it, and that you can justify the changes and the transformations that you make to the data. Whether it's big, medium, or small, they really do not care, but they care about where it comes from, how it's secured, and how it flows. They really don't mind too much about its size. Sure. One of the big issues or concerns that um, I often hear from a lot of people is about, is big data the big brother? And um, so Vasant, you know, can you answer that, your thoughts on, on uh, that question? Um. Yeah, that's a, that's a really hard one because um, I think that, you know, regulators, governments uh, have, a, have a decision to make and have a choice to make uh, in terms of how much they want to observe, how much they want to control, uh, and how they want to preempt undesirable behaviors. One of the things that concerns me is that uh, you know, given the sort of liquidity of data, the ease with which it flows uh, across systems, um, governments really have uh, a lot of power in their hand, uh, and, and, and consequently, uh, the power to uh, actually, you know, maybe infringe on, on people's rights and, and, and the right to be left alone. Um, and that's a decision that I think we need to consider seriously. I think we need to get involved in this uh, and, and make our voices felt. One of the uh, things that I've come across in the younger generation, uh, many of my students who don't seem to be concerned at all about privacy because they say, I have nothing to hide. Uh, my response to that is, you have nothing to hide until you do. Uh, and, and everyone has something to hide. Um, or, or, or something that, would, that they would rather not become publicly available. Uh, so this is a this is a really tough question and, and one I think that requires involvement of, of people in large, um, you know, and, and expressing that to their governments because I think in the absence of that, there's a real danger that we could actually end up using this big data and, and uh, you know, uh, creating sort of a somewhat dystopian future. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, it's just such a challenging topic. You know, it's one of the 
the hypothetical situations that I ask people around banking is, you know, so when I talk about credit decisioning, most people get and understand that banks make credit decisions on you know, typical things around salary, uh, your age, your gender, where you live, and people generally don't have an issue with that. Then I say, okay, well, how do you feel if, if your bank started to look at the behavior, the ATM? How many times do you check your balance before you withdraw? How many times do you check your balance? And most people actually are okay with that also because they feel the bank in some way owns that data but just haven't been using it before. And then you say, okay, what happens? How do you feel if your bank started to collaborate with a telco and they started monitoring who you're calling and, may, and started using that, which would be a great predictor, I suspect, of uh, credit? And at that point, people start saying, I'm uncomfortable with that. You know, so, but, and everybody has a slightly different line. And there's implications. So the example Simon was giving about Aviva and their, their car app, he says, okay, if, if you think you can get a lower premium by having that app, great. But what if you don't like the idea of Aviva or any other insurance company uh, having access to that data? You are now excluded. You are going to be penalized for your right to privacy. How do you feel about that? You know, so there's all these incredibly challenging questions that we're all going to have to navigate. Can, can I maybe follow on on that one? Follow on on that one with uh, the the shift in terms of consumers taking back a little of the control and consent to share their data. And I think it's a, a, a natural exchange in younger generations. And I get to play the young guy on stage, so <laughs> I, I share my data openly on Facebook and Instagram. Add me, by the way. Um, but you know, a lot of people are, I, I think, uh, uneducated or unaware about the amount of data that is out there about them. And it's a, it's a really interesting concept because it's a huge opportunity for, for us as an industry or for regulators to, t to take a step in and, and say, you know, here's, here's what data is available about you and is allowed to be used. I, I think about the, the Equifax data breach in the U.S. and I'm originally from South Florida, and we have the, the Saffir Simpson hurricane scale, and there's the Richter scale for natural disasters like earthquakes. And we talk about data breaches, whether it's Equifax or Target or Ashley Madison, and kind of stand on the news stages and talk about data breach, but the general public doesn't understand how bad that is. So, so one is kind of educating, uh, whether through scales or systems or other mechanisms, uh, the, the broader public around what data is actually available and used about them, as well as also giving back uh, a mechanism to allow the consumer population to consent or allow specific access to their data or not, kind of mitigates some of the, the big brother mentality around always watching, but actually being allowed to watch or given consent to access data. Okay. Let's now make a closing remark. And the theme that I would like to give back to you is, how can big data and analytics enable Singapore and its society to become a smart nation? Simon. Wow. Um, okay, so, I mean, just embrace it. I think that's the, the key thing. And I, for me, I think one of the key things in life is to be curious. I am one of the most annoying people. You know when you're in a, a room and someone says, ask a question, I'm the guy going, me, me, me. So, you know, just be curious, ask questions, challenge the norm, um, use big data, use any data to help you do that, and challenge the status quo. There's this concept of accepting conventional wisdom. I don't subscribe to that. I think that's a really dangerous thing to do. Um, sometimes people have said to me, you really shouldn't have asked that question. And I'm like, why not? If it makes people think, ask the question. Don't lose your job over it, right? But, but you know, be brave. Uh, I think for me, you know, use that as a nation. Uh, I read recently uh, Singapore, there's a, a happiness index that's recently been produced. Um, the Nordic countries and Singapore are right up there as being the happiest people in the world. Congratulations for a start, well done. And I think that the, use, use that because there must be something right here. People that feel open, they feel free, the ability to, to ask those questions and to challenge, you know, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Kevin. And, and the question is on how Singapore can, can benefit from fintech, big data analytics. I'd say lean into it. Um, it it's pretty uh, observant here at this conference with the, the sheer quantities just in this room or in this building. 
uh, from, from the top down, from the government to the fintechs, the banks and the innovators and the whole ecosystem. Um, continue to push the boundaries, continue to collaborate. I think that's probably one of the most interesting things here in Singapore is it's just massive amounts of collaboration from a bank to a fintech to the governments to the innovators. Um, I think to steal a line, I would just continue to lean into it and Singapore's doing a fantastic job on it. I just can't, maybe I'm biased because I've lived here 21 years, uh, but I cannot imagine there is a better country who's better placed to embrace where we are in this whole thing in data. You know, I think, as I mentioned, we've got a great progressive regulator. We're small in nature. We're starting to instrument the whole country, you know, through the smart nation. You know, so we've got funding for education for people. We can attract amazing talent. So all the ingredients are there. And the question I'm starting to ask myself, which I don't have the answer for yet, um, is that if you think about how data can enable a very small company in terms of maybe manpower to scale dramatically and make itself heard on the world stage. Does that apply at the country level? And if so, then I think Singapore is in for great things. What's that? I've got very little to add to that. Um, you know, I, I think you know, from whatever I can see, this is a really progressive society. You know, the level edu of education is sort of generally uniformly high. Um, you know, I think that the opportunity here lies in innovation, right, and being sort of a leading uh, hub for fintech innovation. I mean, I see other countries like the United States or India sort of having some, some pretty severe problems, uh, you know, compared to Singapore when it comes to the use of, of big data. Uh, you know, India in the space of education, for example, you know, I'm working on a project to educate five to ten-year-old kids on mobile devices. Big problem in India because people are, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, kids who don't ha have access to education. You don't have those problems here in Singapore. Um, I think the U.S. has other problems like how to figure out, uh, you know, prevention of, uh, you know, its use of social media by other governments, right? So, uh, you know, I think other countries have, have deeper problems, but wherever I can see here, um, you know, uh, as Paul said, as a progressive regulator, I think the opportunity is real here really to be sort of the, the hub for innovation in fintech. Okay. In conclusion, for the businesses in Singapore, it is about leveraging all of your data and truly being able to gain insight from it and, and have that be part of your day-to-day decision-making and being able to make better decisions. For the government, for the policy makers, it is all about serving society. So as your minister said yesterday, being able to have that information faster so that you can catch that criminal or that threat in a much faster way. And for the audience here who are uh, striving to be data scientists and who are studying to be data scientists or to enhance your career, it's about whole new opportunity, whole new area that you can go into and truly lay out those bricks that really get you to that next level. Thank you very much for uh, being part of this session today.